I want to welcome everybody. This is Deanna Toledo. You've been seeing some of my emails come through. Um, I am uh, the Leadership Development uh, Director for River Network, and um, I am one of the coordinators for the Urban Waters Learning Network, which is um, the host for this, um, for this webinar. Um, the, if you're not familiar with the Urban Waters Learning Network, I can certainly send uh, a link along with a link to this webinar following this session. But it is a peer-to-peer -peer network of people and organizations that are working to protect and restore urban waterways as well as the urban communities through which they flow. So. Um, we make available uh, case studies, webinars such as this to share good information that th we think we can, you can put to use in your work. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, again, uh, engaging elected officials. And we've got three great speakers here today. So let me go ahead and get us started um, and introduce the first of those speakers. Um, we've got, and we are very lucky to have, uh, Sven Eric Kaiser uh, with us from the US EPA Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations. Um, Sven leads the Water, Pesticides, and Toxics team in the US EPA's Congressional Affairs Office. Um, but he has broad experience with the agency, um, coordinating outreach policy and research um, with the EPA Brownfields program prior to his current position, and also working with Superfund Revitalization Office and the Superfund Enforcement Office, as well as others. But he brings also a wide-ranging experience outside of the agency uh, from his time working with US Department of Justice uh, in a congressional office and for the state of New York. Um, Sven has a master's degree in public administration and a law degree from Syracuse University. And I heard Sven speak at a meeting uh, back in December where he gave a very brief uh, summary of how do you effectively engage elected officials that in about 15 minutes covered what could easily be a three-day uh, training on this very topic. So he brings a lot of experience and a lot of enthusiasm, and we're glad to have him here. So he's going to be our first speaker. Sven, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Sven Eric Kaiser with, uh, with EPA. As uh, she said, uh, I really want to say good afternoon to those in the East and good morning to those in the West. And to give thanks to Deanna and, uh, and the Urban Waters Learning Network for putting this together and inviting me. So I'm looking forward to talking with you and listening to, uh, to my co-speakers, Keely and Rick. So first, let me just kind of give a little blessing to all of you working so hard on our waters. I really believe in what you're doing and appreciate your efforts. I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and in Syracuse, uh, the Onondaga Creek there is, a, uh, is now a daylighted creek that uh, I hardly knew existed growing up. And Onondaga Lake was uh, just was an incredible stench from the lake my whole growing up, has received considerable uh, cleanup attention, but uh, I know that there's just so much more still to do. So. I really appreciate all the things you folks are doing. The things I'm going to talk about today are based on uh, my more than 20 years of experience with local environmental revitalization efforts. I've, uh, in the course of things, I've met with hundreds of communities and uh, reviewed thousands of proposals and applications. So I feel like I can bring something to, to the discussion. And currently, I work on uh, congressional relations with, uh, with EPA dealing with members of Congress and their staffs on a daily basis. But I'm speaking to you today in the role of a, of a person with experience in the issues and not as an official representative of EPA. I just wanted to get that out. So I'm looking forward to talking with you. The, the point of this is about engaging elected officials. So let me start with a question just to gauge the audience here. Uh, Dion, I think there's a poll. So I don't know if you want to explain how these work, but I think you just click in the box and it shows the results right up there. So the, the poll is just to get a sense of folks and the level of engagement that we've already got. And I recognize that there's a number of you that have multiple poll folks on the on a single computer. So our apologies for that. If you could just kind of get a polls for for the room um, and respond to the poll accordingly, that'd be great. All right. So 
Uh, this is Sven again. So I'm looking at the, uh, at the returns, and I'm seeing that about half of the group has engaged with, with elected officials more than three times in the last year. And it, another quarter of the group, two to three times. And just a few have really not done too much. So this is a pretty experienced group. So I'm hoping that as I talk through, you'll be able to reflect on things that you've already done or things that you may have uh, planned ahead of you and think about what we're talking about relates to that but then also speaking to folks that haven't engaged, because there was about a quarter of the group that really hasn't done too much of that. So um, the, the second question I have, really focusing in on the target, is have you engaged an elected official this week? How present are these issues for you right now as we speak? This is just a basic yes, no, up, down. All right, we'll give it about another 10 seconds. It looks like just about everybody's voted. And so what we're seeing is about uh, only about a third of you, or we could say a third of you, have done something this week to show just how active we are. And about two-thirds haven't. My goal here is to give you, uh, first to talk to you about some of the things that I've experienced, and then to give you some tools, some knowledge to help you leave this and, and go right into action. So to do that, uh, first, we'll cover some lessons I've learned, and then we'll go over specific steps that you can start right away. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll hear from you, uh, answer each other's questions, exchange ideas, that sort of thing. So I think we'll go into the slides. Deanna, shall I move the slides ahead myself? How, how should we do yes, that? Yes, please do. That would be great. All right. Slide one relates to the poll. So the point of this is engaging with elected officials. Uh, so that you're comfortable with it, you're aware of the, the advantages and disadvantages, and so by the end of this, that you, you just a, a level of comfort, knowledge, and specific things that you can move forward with. I think on the left are our distinguished <laughs> representatives of the country, and on the right is a group, it looks like a Chicago-based group, a mix of, uh, of EPA and local folks in Chicago there. So in my experience, in looking at proposals and applications and talking with, with groups, to kind of this is to set the, the ground, I've learned that there are four things that I can tell right away if a community's got a pretty good shot of, of, of bringing their dreams to fruition. And the first is the existence of a local champion. Someone who's, who's staying up nights, who's doing the extra, who's sweating the bullets, the people who are on this call. I have a feeling that you are the local champions, the drivers for these things. And uh, I've learned over and over that it, it comes down to just those few people that, that have the unflagging energy and enthusiasm to push it forward. But then the second part is, what are they pushing forward? And you can have all the energy and enthusiasm in the world, but without a plan, without a purpose, a direction, you're an unguided missile. So I've learned that uh, people come in with enthusiasm, but then to say, and what's your plan? What's your direction? Where are you going with this? Then the third part is you can be the best champion and have the best plan and roadmap of where you're going, but if you don't have the official support, uh, time after time I've seen great ideas, great plans, just not come to fruition, not be successful, because they didn't have its support, whether it was the mayor, the city council, the county executive, the state folks, or even federal officials, to help them at those crunch times when, uh, when those elected officials, when things came to that point, were they there to help? Will they be there? Are they part of your team? And the fourth, the funding, which is what so much of us focus on, I've learned comes if you have the champion, the plan, and the official support. There's lots of resources out there. The key is how to pull them together to benefit and fuel what you're trying to do. And if you can get the first three parts, the funding will follow. The funding will follow. So today we're focused on the third point there, the official support. That's really what I'm talking about, to enable you, the local champion, to push your plan so that you can get that funding and get the things done that you're looking for. All right. So first we're going to go with things to think about as you're engaging. 
the first thing is that cliche that we've all heard, everything is local. It's about your project. People get worried about elected officials. We're going to go to Washington and change the rules. We're going to do this or that. It's about you and your project. And it's important to focus people to you and your project, to what's happening at the local level, and not to spend too much energy in, in the D DC or in the state capital, but to spend that energy to the extent possible at the local level. When it comes to Washington, there's a very crowded agenda here. It's crisis management, and it's very hard to get the attention. There may be times that it's useful, but the key is to focus on the local end, to remind people that it's about your community and local. All right. The second that goes with that, while we're focusing on everything local, it's that all levels of government matter. There will be times in your project where you need local government assistance. There will be times where you need state government, regional governments, and then finally federal government. All of those pieces are potential partners or potential roadblocks. And so uh, in focusing elected officials, we have to pay attention to all the levels. And so sometimes we get very focused on the local and forget that there are state and federal. Or some people are just very federally oriented and do it that way. But it's important to have contacts at the local government, state government, and federal government, which means that's a lot of people. That's a lot of work. That's a big piece. And it can be very distracting in a lot of different angles. So you know, while putting all that out there, then it's up to the, the group to sense what its priorities are what your time availabilities are and the best way to do it. The third part is engage with officials and their staff. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from a group that said, well, we came to Washington or we went to the state government and our elected official barely had time to meet with us. They palmed us off on the staff. You shouldn't feel that way. That's how the system works. The officials themselves are often so crisis management, so focused on, on the next thing that, that if you really want someone to understand what you're doing, to have a sense of it and be your partner, you've got to engage both the official and their staff. It's fine to seek a meeting with the official, but don't be disappointed if the, the meeting actually happens with their staff. And we can talk some more about that. But, but don't be disappointed if you get a chance to meet with the staff, to explain your issue, to go through it with them, because they're in very close touch with the elected official. And so, so it all connects. Okay, the next point, offer opportunities, not problems. So for officials, most of what they get, probably 75, 80, 90 percent, and maybe there's some elected officials on here that can confirm it, but are problems. People come at you with a complaint, an issue, something you've got to do, something you didn't do. Offer them an opportunity. Be the, the smile they like to see when they see you coming. You don't want them to avoid you because it's, oh, it's you again with your problem, with your river, with your, your issue. Be the person when they see you, oh, great. They're the one that's going to come to me with an opportunity with something that I can do positive. It could be the same issue of how do we clean the river, how do we deal with a community problem. But you can offer it not as a problem, but as an opportunity for them to fulfill their elected role and be the leader that, uh, that, that they think they are. And so give them that chance. Let me just pause for a second to, uh, to flip the sheet. Deanna, are there going to be questions come up on the screen, or shall I just keep going through? What's the, the best way to keep proceed? Keep going. Uh, please, everybody, do use the chat box to type your questions in, and you can type them at any time. We'll, t we'll pause to take them. But you can go ahead, Sven. OK. Let's go to the next one, more things to think about. All right, so the next one, uh, apolitical doesn't mean you're not aware, doesn't mean you're not engaged, but you're open to all sides. Remember, you're trying to solve a problem, not win an election. And the danger here is that if you become associated with one side or one faction or another, if that faction or party or team becomes on the outs, which happens regularly in local, state, and national politics, 
your project becomes on the outs. You don't want to be the political football. You want to be something that the political, the elected officials who are in place see as the opportunity again. Uh, for instance, in the, the Brownfields world that, that I spent a lot of time in, at the national level, uh, they were greatly championed by the Clinton administration, uh, pushed forward, and then a new Bush administration came in, and they were just as enthusiastic and pushed it. It was critical to the program's continuation that it not be linked, like, oh, you're that guy's issue or that person's uh, campaign statement, but to be able to be apolitical. You're open to all sides. It doesn't mean that all sides are going to support you, but you need to be open to all sides, even people you might not think are your natural allies. Okay, next, situational awareness. We all have calendars and cycles. So pay attention to those calendars and cycles. The busiest time of year in Washington, for instance, is March and April. Why is that? Because that's the funding cycle. That's when all the appropriators are going through and doing their budgets and sorting that out. So it's no surprise that, that most of the national organizations have meetings in Washington in March and April where people come in, have their organizational meetings, and fan out to meet with their representatives. Similarly, your state, your local governments have, have, uh, have cycles and calendar events. You know, if you want to engage, probably not that much, the national level is going to happen in August and most people take vacations. Maybe more local events will happen then. Or right before a national, state, or local election. Uh, for instance, we generally assume that after July of an election year in Washington, Nothing's going to happen. Everything that happens after that is a political event and no longer a governmental or a policy event. So you need to have situational awareness. When you're coming forward, think about where you are in the calendar. Are you talking to someone that's a month away from an election? So what they'll be hearing is, how will this affect my election? Or are you talking to someone that's just, just won an election and is looking for new opportunities? Are you talking to someone in the middle of a budget cycle or just coming out of it? And then in addition to situational awareness are the different grant and funding opportunities to know what their cycles are. There's no point in pushing hard for, for attention and partners if you've just finished the, the latest uh, water funding cycle or a, or a different kind of or a brownfields funding cycle or whatever the, the different kinds of grants that are available, whether they're federal or state or local government allocations, to know what those cycles are. Be aware of them and time your events, your activities, your energy to kind of to utilize that. Okay, next, use your partners wisely. So you're all in the partner business. I know you are. I've worked so closely with you, and the reason you're on this is to figure out dealing with elected officials as partners, how to engage them. So use partners wisely. There may be partners that can get into an office better than you can. For whatever reason, they have a good track record. They pipe up in an organizational meeting and say, oh, we've worked with that office very well or with them. Take advantage of that. People like to work with people that they know. We're all human that way. And so use your partners wisely. Different organizations operate better at the local, state, or federal level. If you've got someone in your coalition that's got a lot of experience at the federal level, Listen to them. Use them. Uh, use them to help organize the, you know, get the entree, get the, that initial meeting. But so uh, take stock of who your partners are and what their relations are with elected officials and use them wisely. If you know that a particular group that you're working with as a partner is in, uh, doesn't get along with someone, be sensitive to that as well. Uh, particularly at the local level, things become more and more personal and, uh, and we all build up friendships and animosities. Be sensitive to that. Be aware of it. And uh, take advantage of your strengths and be aware of, of your weaknesses. Okay, next, think about what you want. You need to know what you want. We'll discuss this some more, but at the end of almost every meeting with an elected official or their staff, or at least with the good ones, they'll say, what can I do for you? Sometimes it's just a pro forma. It's so automatic for them. What can I do for you? Don't let that slide by. Don't give that answer of, oh, nothing. I'm just here to tell you what we're up to and keep you informed. 
<laughs> no, you're not. You're there to ask them to do something. And don't be afraid to ask. You can ask politely, but ask clearly. Uh, let the, we'll talk more about the ask. But know what you want as you're engaging. What is the role of this local official? Know that they can't give you a grant given out by a federal agency, or know that the federal officials aren't going to be able to help you with that city council uh, piece that you need to get through. So as you're dealing with the different levels, as we discussed the different levels earlier, as you're dealing with each level, you have to tailor your ask. That ask is crucial. You don't want to let that opportunity go by. You don't want to be in a situation where they uh, perhaps you've met with the staffer or the boss, and at the end of the meeting, after you've left, they rehash, which they always do. They always say, well, what was the point of that? And if they say, I'm not sure. I think they were just going around uh, making sure we knew it was happening. You have missed an opportunity. You want them to say, oh, they were looking for our support to get that regulation altered, or they're looking for our support in that grant application. So know what you want and key it to the right level that you're dealing with. All right, let's move to the next one. All right, even more things to think about. I promise this is the last group of things to think about, and then we'll move into things to do. Provide honest information to all sides. If someone asks you a question, even if it's hostile, even if they seem like a, a doubter, provide an honest answer, provide information. You want to be known as the one who's the truth teller and who has the facts. Sometimes the facts might not be strong in your favor, but be sure that providing the facts helps your cause because you want to be in that situation where if they can only call on one group for the information, that they know that you're good for it, that you'll produce the information and it will be honest information. And you want to provide the same information to both sides. Now, there may be times when a particular faction or group that you may have tactics or may things you discuss because you're working closely with them, that's different than providing factual, honest information to all sides. Even if you think that someone might use that information against you, make sure you provide the information, the facts. Get them on the table. You want to be the one with integrity, with knowledge, and with responsiveness. The next bullet is uh, really the subject of, of the next talker. Keeley will talk more about it. But there are rules to this game. What I'm talking about is engaging, not lobbying. Uh, lobbying is a very specific thing. We'll talk more about it. And there are restrictions for, for groups, for organizations, on what you can advocate for and against. And when it becomes lobbying, when lobbying is allowed, when lobbying is not being allowed, you don't want to get caught up on these lines, and you don't want to be afraid of them. You want to be knowledgeable. You shouldn't be afraid to engage your elected officials because someone says, oh, you're just lobbying them. There's a difference between engaging with partnering, with sharing information, and lobbying. And it's very important to know those rules and to observe them so that you don't trip any wires or hit any landmines. And that's why it's so important what Keeley is going to talk about next. Next bullet, prepare for disappointment. As with any endeavor, you have to open many doors before you find one where the, the payoff is, before you find success. Just because you've engaged or made the effort and you've been rebuffed, they weren't that interested in the meeting, doesn't mean it's no forever. It just means that they're not as receptive or they don't get it. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying for a couple of reasons. One, they are your elected officials that we're talking about here, and they have an obligation at the local, state, and federal level to represent their constituents, you, their constituents, which is why you keep it local. It's a local project. It's not about changing the world. It's not about changing the rules for all of us. It's about your local effort, which they have an obligation, which they generally feel pretty keenly. So even if they rebuff you because they're busy, they're not interested, they don't get what you do, they see it as a distraction from their purpose, be prepared for that disappointment and keep going. Don't let it stop you from your path. And I know that, that you folks have been engaged in this, 
so you're you're used to that, you've seen it. It often becomes a little bit like Charlie Brown and Lucy where you know she keeps putting the football down and they keep kicking at it. Well, you can keep kicking at it. You might want to think about your strategy a little bit. Find out why the goalposts moved or the football got moved before you tried to kick it. Find out why they wouldn't take the meeting or why they weren't willing to help you write that letter or sign on to your campaign. There might be a reason you don't understand, but, but be persistent and be flexible. Last of the things to think about, no one said this was going to be easy. You are in a marketplace of competing ideas, competing needs, competing issues. Everyone jostling for attention, for funding, for time. And so what helps you rise above? Is it your persistence? Is it your message? Is it the, sometimes it's the, uh, an issue sexy. It's attractive to people on the surface, but do they get involved in it for the depth of it? This isn't going to be easy. And I believe it rewards the long haul, that it rewards preparation, it rewards partnerships. Uh, going back to the previous bullet, it rewards people that try and try again. You're in a competition. Just because you called up the, the mayor's office or the state legislator's office and said, we'd like to come in and meet with you, lots of people are calling them and pushing for that meeting or for that assistance or for that letter of support. Just remember that you're in the marketplace and you want to provide them with the reason why what you're doing is important to you and to them, why this is an opportunity and why this is something that they want to take advantage of, that it's to their benefit. And even in the course of it, look at it in their view. If you were that person, what would make your cause, your issue, your need feel like something that they want to identify with? All right. Any questions on that? So there's some questions there. I'm looking at one from Jen. Um, Jen's asking, I'm just going to repeat it out, is it okay to make an easy ask, thinking ahead in your next visit you'll have a larger ask, or better to wait until right for that larger ask? You should wait, or you should use the most present Good ask. On. Pardon? If anybody else has joined the phone, please, uh, Press uh, pound six to dial it uh, to mute your line. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, ben. So for Jen, you should ask the thing that you need. Then focus on. Uh, it can be an easy ask, but focus on the thing you really need. Prioritize. What are the two or three things we really need? If you know, maybe, well, we need $10 million ultimately to fulfill our vision. But for the phase that you're in now, for the cycle that this official is in now, uh, is it a vote that they're coming up to and you want to provide information? Is it a, uh, a, a grant that they're trying to decide? Maybe they're trying to decide whether to apply for a grant or you want to advise them. Or perhaps it's a federal folks going through the process. Ask the most present thing, the thing that's right in front. You know, don't try to ask for you know, a nibble of this and a nibble of that in hopes that they'll bite the bigger cheese down the road. It should be the most present thing. So there's some urgency, some need, some specificity. Next week, we need this. Next month, we request you do that. So they know pretty precisely. OK. Now, so we've talked about things to think about. So all of you are thinking about all the things you've done, and I bet many of you are saying, I've done that, I've tried that, this isn't, this isn't anything new. And no, these are all based on experiences that I've seen, uh, lessons I've learned, which is code for <laughs> things that didn't go right. We often learn more from the ones that didn't work out than the ones that did. So now we're going to turn to the next stage. So lots of things to think about. But now let's turn to verbs, things to do, actions to take. Ready? So first, you should be briefing your elected officials and their staff at each level of government. You should be trying to get in the door and meet with them, provide them the information that they might not even know they need yet. Just because they haven't called on you doesn't mean you can't call on them. And you should start the process. The keys to this are, uh, is to getting in the door is to knowing uh, either your group 
knows someone, knows the key staffer, or someone, one of your partners knows someone or knows a key staffer or knows the official, or sometimes you can go in through the front door. We're with particular river group. We'd like to talk with whoever handles your environmental issues or your particular river issues. You can ask the person who handles the issues, who's my point of contact in your office? This works very well at the federal level where they have many, many issues carefully allocated across their portfolios, works at the state level, and works at the local level. So if you don't have a contact already, just ask, who's your point of contact? You may know someone who, in the office who isn't the person who works on your issues. Ask them, who would be my point of contact with trying to work on this grant, this project, this issue, this meeting we're going to have? Just ask. You know you're doing real well if you get a hold of the scheduler, because that means you're actually uh, engaging with, with the member, the elected person. But if you're still working with the staff, that's fine. And even if you're dealing with the scheduler and the member, continue to include your point of contact, the staffer. Don't circumvent that person, because when the, the elected official hands it to the staffer to, to do the action you've requested, you want them to feel fully bought into this. So believe in them, support them, keep them looped in on, on any messages that you send to the boss. Send it to the staff person who's your point of contact. All right, so you're scheduling your briefings, whether it's because you're coming to Washington. Uh, so let's say you're, you're coming to, well, we'll talk about this, coming to D.C. and that. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, prepare the one-pager. So let's say you get the call, yep, we've got a slot. I've got 15 minutes to, to hear you out. I've been hearing about your, your, your issue. Uh, can you come in? You want to have a one-pager with your key messages, your project status, your next steps. Three sections. What's your top line message? I need help on this piece of it. Is your top line message, we're a danger from contamination? Is your top line, whatever your top line message is, and it's different for each project, for each briefing, your top line message, the, the overall status of your particular effort. Uh, we started in 1984. Uh, we've, been, we've had this success and that. The phase three is the following. Let them know some context, just a few bullets, three to five bullets on key messages, three to five bullets on the status of your project, and then the next steps so they know where this is heading. This has got to be in a one-pager. Don't spend a lot of time making it super slick. You want this to be a document that you can hand out and not have them look at it and say, wow, it looks like you spend a lot of time and money making your one-pager slick. When what's important here is getting the information across. Don't cram it so full of information that it's too dense. It's got to be something that they can look at and get the key message, the current status, the, the project status, basically the background on your project, and then the next steps, what's happening. That one-pager is your your key. That's what you're going to be handing out. That's what you're going to be talking from. When you only have 10, 15 minutes to get someone's attention, maybe you have three minutes. That's what you use to hone your message, to know what's on your mind. And if you can't get it on one page, then you haven't honed your message well enough. You should be able to give that one, mess that one pager message, whether or not you have that one pager in hand. If you get the opportunity in a hallway, in an elevator, in a, at someone's home, you know, you never know the opportunity. But can you get that message across with or without the piece of paper? And do you have the piece of paper that you can send them, that you can hand them? So the one-pager is not just the piece of paper you put in front of them, but it's the device you use to focus your thoughts and message which leads right into the developing a focused request, which we just talked about honing your ask. You get to ask for one, maybe a second thing, each time you engage. Are you asking them to attend your next meeting? Are you asking them to support your application? Are you asking them to change a local regulation or to look at a federal uh, clause or something? What is it you're asking? Hone that ask and focus it. I don't want to talk about it too much because we've already talked about it. But make sure when you leave that interaction, whether it's a briefing, a meeting, a roundtable, whatever the interaction is, 
that, that they remember, oh yeah, they needed me to do this. Whether you leave that with the elected official or the staffer, that there's no doubt in their mind, why did I talk to that person again? What did I talk to them about? All right. And then follow up. You've met with them. Follow them up with a thank you, whether it's a briefing, whether an interaction. And in that thank you, what are you thanking them for? You're not thanking them for saying hi. You're thanking them for paying attention to you and your issue, and possibly reminding you, thanking them, uh, maybe in advance or maybe for something they offered to do, thanking them for some piece of assistance. If you're not thanking them, why are you communicating with them? You've given them a piece of information. that you, They said to you, can you give me more info on that? You say, Here's the information you asked for. Thanks for your attention. That thank you has got to be in the same cycle. I try to do it the same day. Sometimes you can't, and it's got to be the next day. Let's say some information or something you're going to do takes a little longer. You still thank them in the same cycle. Thank you for your attention. We'll be getting that, you that information in the next few days. So if whatever the action is that you're going to be getting, thank them in the same cycle. And remind them why they met with you, why you spoke with them. These are very specific things. Okay. More things to do, as if you didn't have enough already. Once you find the point of contact for the local elected officials or the state official or the federal level, get them on your notification and mailing list. Even if they seemed lukewarm or inattentive or unaware of what you're doing, get them on the list. Keep sending them things until they ask to be taken off. That's a very simple action you can do, and I'm sure that all of you have, have some kind of, of list that you keep of who you're dealing with. Get those lists together. Have those mailing lists, whether they're uh, you know, all the different kinds of electronic mailing lists or however you keep them. Get those staff contacts on your notification list, on your mailing list. Every time you're taking an action, whether it's having your next meeting, whether it's announcing something you've received or an application you've sent, you ought to be telling people, not just your elected officials, but your partners, your members, your funders. You should be having these notification lists. Elected officials and their staff point of contacts should be on those lists. Okay, the, a very specific thing you should be doing, if you haven't already, is inviting the officials and the staff to the next roundtable or event. If appropriate, invite them to speak at it. Know that if you invite them to the event, they often expect to speak. So if you're inviting them to attend and you really don't want them to speak, make that pretty clear. Because if I'm the local elected official and I come to an event, I'm expecting at some point I get to talk on the mic. That's the price of your having me. The same thing with state and federal officials. Invite the officials and the staff to the roundtable or event. They might not always attend, and they'll generally cancel at the last minute, or they'll send a substitute, but they, one, appreciate being invited, two, might actually show, three, get something out of it, and fourth, uh, contribute to your event and show that you have the support of officials, which all the rest of your partners uh, will appreciate. This is how you, you, you get people engaged, how you keep them engaged. Invite them to the round table or event. Be prepared for, for them to not even respond. You know, our manners aren't so good these days, and sometimes people show up you weren't expecting, and more often than not, they say they were going to be there, but they don't make it. That's okay. Don't let it hurt your feelings. Persist. Oh, uh, that is next. Request letters of support for your applications. So here's a funny thing. So I worked in the Brownfields program for 15 years. We got in uh, five, six, seven hundred applications for the one or two hundred grants we were able to give out each year. So maybe one in three, one in four. And many of the applications got letters of support from their senators, their mayors, their state officials, various elected officials. There's no particular points or credit associated with those letters. You don't get three points for a senator, two points for a mayor, that sort of thing. But there's two benefits for requesting letters of support. One, it shows that you've engaged. It shows to funders that you're aware of the world, that you have partners, and that people support your project. 
that's a good thing. And there are various places in grant applications and different kinds of things where you get points for that. They may not say you get a letter from each, you get a point for each letter from an elected official, but it gets you there. It moves you forward and demonstrates a physical demonstration of support. And the second thing, and perhaps in a more subtle way, a more powerful way, is it actually gets your elected officials directly engaged. It's an easy thing for them to do. Many times these are pro forma letters of support that, uh, that don't take much effort on their part, but commit them. They're saying publicly, I support your project. The importance of that can't be underestimated. For once they've signed on to it, their name is on it. I've supported that project publicly. That's a very powerful thing for them, for their staff, and for you and your partners. So even if you think, well, this is just a, the, the agency offering, uh, the group offering this funding support said they, we don't get any credit for these letters. Get them. Get them. Go into the office and say to that elected official, we would like your support. Here's a sample. You need to provide them with a sample of what that one-page letter looks like. One-page letter, it's a sample. Basically, you're writing a letter that they could send. They're welcome to modify it to suit their taste or to put it, or they may just send it directly. But that letter needs to say the name of, of your project, clearly, the name of whatever it is you're applying for, so that there's no doubt at the recipient's end that the people sending this letter had a clue. Very often we got letters from members of, of Congress saying, I support this Brownfield thing, almost in parens, whatever it is, you know, misspelled it, didn't know the office they were sending it to. It, it showed a lack of, of awareness by the, the organization applying and a lack of interest by the member. So be very specific on the name of the project, who you are, what you're applying for, and then the key part of this letter of support is what this grant, what this action, what this special initiative you're applying for, how it applies to your community. What is it going to do for you? Because lots of letters say, I support the river group in my city. Why? What? Because this cleanup project will, uh, will enable us to enjoy recreation, because this will improve our drinking water, because it will enjoy our recreational opportunities. Be very specific on what you're applying for and what the benefit is. That shows an attention to this particular opportunity and the result. These letters of support are very specific and very helpful. All right. Next, big checks, ground bakings, and ribbon cuttings. Elected officials love a parade. They love to be in front of the parade. They're forever seeking them for the most part. There are some shy, reticent ones, but not many. It's the business they're in. Give them the opportunities. If you've received a big check from an organization, have a little ceremony. Invite the elected officials. If you're having a groundbreaking on your project, get the big shovel. Be out there. And a ribbon cutting, get the big scissors. Have the event. Yes, an elected official who might not have been directly involved may get some public credit for it. Let them get in front of your parade. Your goal is the project. This is a tool that gets you there. Don't be afraid of these. They seem trite and corny. People need affirmation. And this is a very direct and physical affirmation of success. Celebrate it. Don't hide it. Celebrate it. Okay, next. I'll try and speed up a little bit. I realize I'm going a little long. Encourage mobile workshops and site tours. I have visited hundreds of communities, been in hundreds of meeting halls, town halls, uh, office buildings. I don't remember hardly any of them. I do remember being in Portland and touring the Willamette River going on the side banks. I do remember uh, you know, being in Providence, Rhode Island and walking the Providence River. You remember the harbors, the rivers. Get people out to your projects. Don't hide them away in the town hall. Don't, you know, rent out the hotel room. Get these elected officials out on your sites. Even if it's for an hour, a half an hour, incorporate a tour into what you're doing. All right, this is the last set of things to do. We talked about provide recognition. Give elected officials speaking opportunities. Give them an award. Make, if they're helpful, make them your county man of the year, your national leader of this. Make it up. They're, they're totally uh, not shy and bashful. They put these up on their wall. They send them out. <laughs> Give them an award. Give them a citation. 
thank them publicly in a way that appeals to elected officials. You may feel like you are cheapening your cause, weakening what you do. Provide recognition. That's part of what they seek. Get in their mind. Why do they smile when they see you coming? Because good things happen at the local level in your community, and they get some credit for it. This next bullet, the data and facts. We talked about providing information, having data, and integrity with that data. Have it ready. If someone says, I need this for a city council meeting in two hours, you better supply it, because if you don't, someone else will. And they won't call you the next time. If your member of Congress says, hey, I'm giving a speech uh, tomorrow, I need some, some background. You've got to bust your butt and get that information to them, or they won't ask you again. You want to be the go-to person for data and facts, data and facts that they, they're neutral and that they respect. All right, next, we talked about this briefly. When you're coming to the state capitol or to Washington, D.C., schedule the meetings. Personally, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go out of your way to schedule a meeting, but as part of a Chamber of Commerce thing or part of a national meeting or part of something, you come to D.C., you come to your state capitol. The key to scheduling these meetings with your members and their staff is to use the local office. To get into the D.C. office, call your local office of the, of the member of Congress and say, we're coming to D.C. next week for a national meeting. We'd like to meet with a point of contact in D.C. So don't... Don't kill yourself banging on a wall when there are hundreds and hundreds of people trying to get those meetings in. Use your local point of contact to get you the national point of contact. They love to do that. The local folks love to help get the local folks in at the national level. The same thing at the state level. Use the district office, the field office, to get you in. That's the key to building that local staff contact. And then when you are in D.C., be prepared for a 15-minute meeting with a staffer, with your one-pager, with your own to ask, with your letter, your draft letter, we need you to do this letter, whatever it is, take advantage of that opportunity. The time will change on you suddenly. The venue will change. They'll say you'll meet with the, the senator, but you'll end up meeting with their staffer. Be flexible. Last, acknowledge support when successful. You know, they, what's the line? Success has a thousand fathers, failures, and orphan. Don't be that orphan. When something goes right, give the credit out as widely as possible. Fulfill that saying. There, you can't share success widely enough. So let me move to my parting thought. As we go through all of these thoughts, as you go through all of this, think back to that first question of who, the second question, who had engaged? How are you going to engage with an elected official this week? Which of these specific things are you and your organization going to be able to do to touch, to make that contact, to engage, to help you in your mission? That wraps me up. So do we want to take questions now? Or, Jan, have I taken so much time that we need to move forward? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I not Jan. Sorry, one, Deanna. No, I just see one question on the uh, box. If you want to go ahead and take that while I oh, uh, yeah. load up the next presentation. Okay. So Jan says, what if you invite multiple local officials to an event? How do you keep them all from speaking? Well, that's a tricky thing. They get the mic. They, <laughs> they want to talk. So you say to them, you can say to them directly. They do this all day in and out. Say, I, you know, I've, I can give you two minutes. They'll take five. I can give you one minute. They'll take three. I can give you 10 minutes. They'll take 20. So just double in your head whatever time that you have and give it to them. And then say, you know, thank them very much and, and take the mic back. You may come in times when people just hog it, but you've got to be in charge of your microphone. They do this all day long. So they're, they're used to people saying, oh, that's it, got to wrap it up. People like me, like I talk and talk. Deanna can okay. say, Sven, you've got to wrap it up. I'm used to that. <laughs> be all diplomatic. Right. Do it with a smile. Say, that is so great. That's so wonderful. But you used up half of our time. <laughs> Don't say that. Just say, this is great and wonderful. That was great and wonderful, and I'm seeing that a few folks um, are typing their questions. So if you want to, um, okay, question, could we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Uh, absolutely. We will send that out along with a link to the recording. What we'll probably do is just send a PDF of the slides um, to handle the file size. Um, there's a question from Jennifer, just briefly. When sharing information on grant program or project, what is the key info that elected officials are looking for? Sure. Uh, so what is the key thing they're looking for? What are the bullets you've got to have on there? Uh, they need to know what the issue is, uh, 
what this solution is, what the benefit is, and what you're asking them. So sometimes they'll ask you specific, how many, how many miles of rivers do we have in our community? So that's a, a clear fact. But more generally, they want to know what's the issue and what's the plan? What's next? What's the next step? What can I do to help this? So you can say to them, our goal, our big goal, is to make this river swimmable, fishable. But our next step, mayor, our next step, state senator, is to get the state grant that enables to do some bank repair work. And you can help us with that through the following. And let's just take this last question before we go to Keeley. Any tips on engaging a sure-to-be-elected mayoral candidate when you have a meet? I would, here's the thing about engaging all sides. Maybe they're elected, maybe, see, if they're in campaign mode, then they're trying to get your vote. They really don't care what message you're sending as long as they can get you to vote for them. So that's not so helpful to your cause and maybe helpful to their cause, but don't think because they smiled and shook your hand that they were supporting you. They're just hoping to get your vote. So engage with them. Uh, let's say it's the city council member who you know is going to run for mayor or someday for Congress or senator or governor. Uh, treat them all as elected officials or potential ones and use these same things. Right now, I want to engage with you so you know what I'm up to so that uh, can you help with this? Great. And I wouldn't spend too much time on, and when you're elected governor, you can do this for us. They can't help you yet. Wait until they're governor. Then ask, make that ask. Because they're really just trying to get your support and not trying to support your project, which is what you're really after. Great. Let me go ahead, and there's another question. I'm going to encourage folks to type questions even while the presenters are doing um, their presentation, and then we'll come back at the end and answer all questions. I just want to make sure in the interest of time we'll turn it to Keeley. So thank you so much, Sven. Appreciate um, sharing your experience here with us. Um, mm -hmm. And let me turn it then to Keeley, who is is counsel for uh, the Alliance for Justice's Boulder Advocacy Initiative. Many of you, if you're NGOs, have heard of Alliance for Justice because they put a lot of excellent materials on this very topic that Keely is going to be talking about. Um, as part of her role, she consults and trains NGOs on the rules and strategies for legal and effective advocacy, including lobbying, election-related activity, ballot measures, etc. Um, prior to that, she worked with hundreds of uh, chapters of law students for reproductive justice as the director of campus and community programs, providing guidance to their advocacy uh, at the state and community level. Keely is also an attorney. Um, she has a BA from Fordham University um, and uh, a law graduate from University of California at Hastings College. So without further ado, Keely, you want to take it away and run your own slides? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me on your webinar today, Sven. That was a fantastic presentation, as you sort of said, around what does it mean to engage? How can you be an advocate with elected officials? And now, after sort of seeing a, a, a very big picture of it, I'm going to sort of narrow down and talk a little bit about advocacy generally, but then really go into what does it mean to lobby, how can we lobby as 501c3s, and what are our limits in lobbying as 501c3s. Now, before I start, I also want to say, you know, because of timing, um, you know, I am going to try to go slowly but quickly, if that makes sense, with the information, but this is not the last time that you can engage with Boulder Advocacy. This is not the last time you uh, can have a conversation with me about your lobbying campaigns. Um, Boulder Advocacy is a, is a program of Alliance for Justice, and we do support nonprofit organizations in a host of ways, just like these webinars. We do in-person trainings. We also do technical assistance. So if after this webinar you think, oh, I really have a question, I'm not sure if I'm doing something right or wrong, we have an attorney on call every day to answer those questions for free. 
And then lastly, we have this very, very robust web, uh, website that has in-depth resources, that has fact sheets, and I believe some fact sheets are actually going to get sent to you uh, after this webinar, so you'll get a chance to um, see some of our resources that way. All right, so let's get started here. Here's our roadmap for the day or for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to start by quickly just sort of doing the lay of the land, looking at 501c3s, 501c4s, and 527s, and what, what are their powers, what are their responsibilities, and what are their limitations. How Congress and IRS have defined how you calculate your limits in lobbying for 501c3 organizations how the IRS defines lobbying, and then just one quick slide on other laws at the federal and state level that you should at least be aware of when you're out there lobbying. Okay, so let's get started here. You'll see we have um, some numbers going across the top of the screen, 501c3, 501c4s, and 527s. Now, 501c3s, organizations like the River Network, organizations like the League of Conservation Voters Education Fund, organizations like Alliance for Justice, and I'm assuming like the vast majority of you on this line, that's going to be the biggest group of these three categories. Why? Because there's some really, really fantastic uh, benefits to being a 501c3 public charity. First of all, in addition to being tax exempt, contributions to your um, organization are tax deductible. And that means when you or your development team goes out there, sends emails, does a, 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 um, a, you know, a, 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 a campaign out there, they can say, hey, please give money to us, and then when you give that money, your contribution is tax deductible. That's a huge benefit. Lastly, 501c3 public charities get preferential treatment from foundations for grants. Now, private foundations are actually another type of 501c3 organization. But because they um, have a very small pool of donors, one person, a family, a corporation, they have these additional restrictions on them, and they prefer to grant money to 501c3 public charities because then they don't have to have these expenditure responsibilities. So 501c3 public charities um, get preferential treatment from five foundations. Now, with those benefits come some limitations. 501c3 public charities are able to lobby a limited amount. A lot of people think 501c3s can't lobby. That's not true. 501c3 public charities can lobby a limited amount, and we're going to talk about how you calculate that limit. And lastly, 501c3s are never able to engage in partisan political activity. They're never able to support or oppose candidates for office. And I just want to flag there, Denise, when you brought up your question, engaging a candidate for mayor, essentially, uh, when you meet. Now, there are some important rules. If you are a 501c3, I see that you're an NAACP, so you may be a C4. But if you're a C3, there's some pretty important rules around that, um, and I, I encourage you if you have questions to reach out to me, my email address will be on the last slide. So then quickly, 501c4s are social welfare organizations. Uh, they're created to promote the general welfare of their communities, tax exempt, but they don't have those that great uh, tax deductible contributions benefit, nor do they get preferential treatment from private foundations. But they are able to limit, un they have an unlimited capacity to lobby as long as it's related to their purpose, as long as it's related to their social welfare purpose, the mission of their organization. And secondly, they are actually able to engage in partisan political activity as long as it's a secondary and not primary activity. Lastly, we have political organizations, or 527. These are their sole purpose is to engage in partisan political activity supporting candidates, getting money for candidates, getting volunteers for candidates. These organizations are also tax exempt, but they rarely lobby. It's usually taxed if they do, and again, sole purpose is that partisan political activity. So let's move forward. What is advocacy? Um, now, I think I was going to have a poll here, but let's just move forward since we're running a little bit short on time. Now, 
we at Alliance for Justice, we call these sort of our avenues of advocacy. And I really liked how Sven went through a lot of these. Green, as you can imagine, means go. You know, educating legislators, getting to know legislators. But in addition to that, public education, organizing, um, regulatory efforts, trainings. Lobbying is in yellow because you want to slow down. There are some rules. And then, of course, red for partisan political activity because 501c3s are prohibited in engaging in any partisan political activity. So how much lobbying? As I said on that chart sheet, um, 501c3 public charities are able to engage in lobbying, but it's limited. So we've got some tests here. Congress has laid out two different tests for 501c3s to calculate their lobbying limits. The insubstantial part test is the default test. Now that's when you get your status as a 501c3, you are under the insubstantial part test. And we at Alliance for Justice, we don't like this test. It's vague. The IRS nor Congress has ever defined what insubstantial means. In addition to having to calculate and, and to record your expenditures, you have to record your activities, volunteer activities, board activities, attending rallies potentially, attending conferences potentially. In addition, they don't define lobbying well. Neither, the con neither Congress nor the IRS has defined lobbying well, and the penalty if you exceed this vague, insubstantial standard is potentially losing your tax-exempt status. So because of this vague, confusing, not well-defined test, in the 70s, Congress created an, a new section of the tax code, tax code called 501H. And we sort of like to joke around here that we're like the 501H um, evangelist because we think it's a really great test for the vast majority of 501C3s. First of all, all you have to do is fill out a form, Form 5760. It's a super easy form. It's essentially your employer I identification number, your name, and maybe the date. I think that might be it, maybe the address of your organization. It's a very easy form to fill out. And it's a dollar based, so you're only thinking about expenditures. You don't have to think about, for example, volunteer activities, board activities, things like I was saying before. It has a very well-defined definition of both direct and grassroots lobbying, which we're going to get into in a minute. And the penalties are much less severe. Even to get to the point where you might have your, ex your tax-exempt status revoked, you have to be at over 150% of your lobbying uh, for four years. So this is the definition of insubstantial part that for lo the definition of lobbying for organizations that use the insubstantial part test. Really the piece that you want to look at here is just that last one, which is advocating the adoption or rejection of legislation. That's very, very broad. And then in a minute we're going to see what the definitions for direct and grassroots lobbying are, and you're going to see how narrow that is. So that's why we like the 501H expenditure test much better. And we'll just skip that. That's the 990. So lobbying limits under the 501H expenditure test, very easy to uh, calculate. You first look at what your exempt purpose expenditures are, which for most organizations is your annual expenditures. You do a calculation with this handy graduated calculator. We actually have a spreadsheet that does this part for you. Then with this overall lobbying limit, as you see in the right-hand column, you, you get a number, whatever that number is. And then your grassroots lobbying limit is 25% of that overall limit. And I know, I'm, again, I'm going kind of fast, but we're going we're gonna to do another example, and I hope it will become um, much clearer for you. But you see, as you go through your annual expenditures, what your budget is, then you see what you, then that's when you, uh, you can do the calculation on the right-hand side. Let's get that one. So here's that example, total lobbying limits. This is for a 501c3 that has made the 501h election that has annual expenditures of $500,000. Now with that calculation, we know that any organization that has annual expenditures of $500,000 or less, 
their overall lobbying limit is $100,000. That's a lot of money. People think to themselves, I'm a C3, I can only lobby a little amount. I'm a C3, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about lobbying because I don't want to hit some limit. I don't want to... Um, do something prohibited, but it, your lobbying limit is $100,000, and again, as I said on that last slide, grassroots lobbying limit is, is a quarter of that, or $25,000. So what is lobbying under the 501H expenditure test? So now, I w love if people wanted to sort of think about this, and then think about what Sven was talking about, the different ways that you can engage with your legislators that don't include these exact elements, which again just means you're being a fantastic advocacy organization, you're advocating for the issues that you care about. Those were those green go avenues of advocacy. Only when you meet all of these elements under direct or all of these un elements under grassroots will your communication be considered lobbying. So, First, let's tackle direct lobbying. Direct lobbying is a communication with a legislator that expresses a view about specific legislation. Now, communication can be anything. It can be a tweet, it can be a call, it can be a letter, it can be a visit, as Ben talked a lot about, what a visit could look like. And legislators are at every level of government, the federal and their staff, state and their staff, as well as local and their staff. But in addition to as people that you would assume are legislators, as the executive officials can be considered legislators when we're asking them partic to participate in the formulation of legislation. Please, President Obama, veto that bill if it comes to your desk. Please, President Obama, sign that bill if it comes to your desk. In addition, agency officials can become can be considered legislators. When does the EPA administrator be considered a legislator? When you're asking um, her to essentially step into the shoes of a legislator to try to use her influence to influence legislation, that would be she would be considered a legislator. Now, people who are not legislators special purpose boards like school boards, planning commissions, zoning commissions, water or sewer districts, if you engage with any of those uh, boards, you could have a communication that expresses a view, but it's not going to be considered lobbying. Now we have this special legislator rule. Now with this special legislator rule, I'm talking about ballot measures, bond measures, ballot initiatives, where essentially it's going to a public vote. Now that means that the public are considered unpaid legislators in the eyes of Congress. So if you do work on a proposition, on a ballot measure, that's actually going to be considered direct lobbying and not grassroots lobbying. Members of the general public as legislators. So quickly, what constitutes specific legislation? Anything with a bill number, anything with a name, in addition, any advocacy you do around the budget, or judicial nominations that require Senate confirmation. Lastly, there are pieces where even if there isn't a pending piece of specific legislation, it may be considered lobbying when someone has a bright idea. If you've identified a problem and the solution could be or should be legislation, that would count as lobbying. Not legislation, regulations, executive orders, enforcement of existing laws, and legislation. I saw on the River Network website that you all were doing some work around the Clean Water Protection Rule, which is a regulation, not considered lobbying. Now grassroots lobbying, we're going to speed through this. Grassroots lobbying, the piece that's essential here is the call to action. Now luckily, the IRS has laid out four calls to action, very specific ones, and you need one in order for your communication to be considered grassroots lobbying. You need to either tell the general public to contact their legislators, providing the address, telephone, or contact information for legislators, 
providing a mechanism to enable communication with a legislator or identifying legislators. So let's look at a couple quick examples here of a grassroots lobbying communication, a communication with the general public that expresses a view about specific legislation with a call to action. Here we've got one from MALDEF asking Congress to pass the DREAM Act. You'll see on the first to second line, call Congress. That was the first call to action that we talked about. Then you'll see in the bolded paragraph, call your respective senators and House members now with phone numbers. That was the second call to action. Now note, you don't need both of those to make it a, a call to action. You only need one of them. But just that this is a good example of two calls to action. There we go. Here's another one. A mechanism, Natural Resources Defense Council, provided a mechanism where you put your name, address, and it figures out who your legislator are, legislators are and shoots it to them. That's a mechanism. And lastly, identifying legislators where you're just saying, here are legislators. We've identified these legislators, for example, who's un who are undecided on a nomination who are undecided on their vote if they're on a committee, just identifying legislators. So again, in the interest of time, I had a couple of examples of grassroots lobbying, but we're going to speed through. And again, if anybody has any questions, we will um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, the last piece I just want to touch on is the, the, the sort of the pieces, the substantive pieces that I was discussing today. That is in relationship to your status as a 501c3 organization and how the, the IRS um, has limits, limited your lobbying capacity. But in addition to that, there are federal, state, and even sometimes city disclosure laws and disclosures related to the transparency of your actions. So again, if you are engaging in lobbying at the state, federal, or local level, you want to look into to see if you need to file as a lobbyist, either the LDA, which is the Lobby Disclosure Act, at the federal level or at the state level. We actually have 27 state-based resources on our website, so if you live in one of those states, or you're in, I should say if you're engaging in lobbying in one of those states, that will be very helpful for you. Lastly, these are two of our in-depth resources that I think may be helpful. Again, if you want to get a primer on lobbying, a primer of record keeping. You know, as a 501c3, we have to record what lobbying we do because we have to calculate it because we have, you know, it's limited, so we have a limited amount. These are two great resources. Lastly, we have two capacity building tools. So if anyone's ever interested in sort of seeing what, how ready, the readiness of your organization to engage in advocacy, these are on our website. They're free online tools. And with that, here's the information for our, our, our different offices. Um, and you'll see, um, which is handy, my Twitter handle is actually also my email address if you put the at in between Keeley and AFJ. So you are welcome to email me, Keeley at AFJ.org, if, um, if you have any questions about what we just went over. Thanks so much. Um, Keely, I think if you can just briefly answer these two questions um, that came up. Does advocating for a local ordinance constitute lobbying? So if the local ordinance is going to be voted on by, for example, your city council, yes, because that's going to be um, if you're communicating with a legislator, who in, which includes city councils, on a specific piece of legislation, expressing a view on a specific piece of legislation, that is going to count. And I actually think we have a fact sheet on local ordinances on our website. So I would in encourage you to go to our website, boulderadvocacy.org, to see. Um, uh, that, what is it to provide? So I think, Rusty, that's my answer is it's going to depend. Um, where who's asking the technical question and if you're sort of coming down on one side of the legislation. Um, 
a lot of times what I just like to tell people is the vast majority of times C3s are not even close to their limit. So if you're sort of thinking to yourself, is this lobbying, is this not lobbying, and you're sort of you know, biting your nails over it, just count it as lobbying because it takes less time to just count it as lobbying than to sort of get into this nitty-gritty, weedy place, um, again, because most organizations are not near, not near at all their lobbying limit. Now, if you are near your lobbying limit, that's different, and I would encourage you to email me or call me. Great. All right, Keely, thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned earlier, much. all presentations will be made available, so you'll have access to Keely's presentation, and I definitely uh, strongly encourage you all to check out their website, Alliance for Justice and, and this Boulder Advocacy Initiative provide great resources which, which many 501c3s have been using for, for years to really uh, help them understand this whole area of the law. So um, thank you so much, Keely. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn then in the last 15-20 uh, minutes we have here to our final speaker which is um, Rick Magder, who has lots of on-the-ground experience, and he's, he's going to share um, his experience and his success uh, really uh, using uh, local official engagement for the benefit of uh, his river. Um, Rick is the ch chief executive for Groundwork Hudson Valley, a 15-year-old organization that runs a number of programs, including the daylighting of the Sawmill River, which he'll talk about today. Um, he's also the former ED for Groundwork USA, which he helped develop alongside Groundwork Hudson Valley. And in leading that national organization, um, he helped develop Groundwork USA's National Urban Waters Program. So currently he provides ongoing technical assistance to a number, um, to the network of Groundwork Trusts around the nation on a range of nonprofit capacity building issues, um, including this very topic that he's going to talk about. So. Um, Rick, love to hear your story about the sawmill. Take it away. Thank you, Deanna. And uh, I guess, Keely, great presentation. I, I was hoping to go to the mayor's golf tournament, which supports his re-election campaign, but I guess I can't do that now. So, <laughs> um, so um, Groundwork, uh, some of you may have heard of Groundwork uh, before. We, this is our motto, Changing Places, Saving Lives. We were uh, started by the EPA Brownfields Program and the National Park Service Rivers and Trails Program back in the late 90s um, based on a model in Great Britain called Groundwork UK. And so there's, if you, if you uh, look that up, there's Groundwork London and Groundwork Birmingham and you know, about uh, 40 groundwork organizations around uh, the United Kingdom and now in the United States, as you can see in this map, so it, it is a little blurry. Um, there's about 20 groundwork organizations around the country, and we're just starting Groundwork Indianapolis, Groundwork Atlanta, and Groundwork Jacksonville this year. Um, there will be a round of uh, funding to start new groundwork trusts later this year, so if you're interested, you can send me an email and I'll get you in touch with the right people. Um, the main purpose of groundwork, really, is to go into uh, communities that have uh, significant uh, physical and land issues and river issues and actually it started out as a kind of a land-based vacant lot um, revitalization initiative but quickly evolved into a, a you know, urban water program that uh, pretty much every town we're in has a, an old river or creek that's polluted or uh, compromised in some way and so we ended up doing uh, kind of unexpectedly a huge amount of urban waters work and this is just some of the work that we do in Yonkers, that's the Science Barge um, to your right, which is a floating sustainable farm on the Hudson River, right at the, at the confluence of the Sawmill River. So it is a, uh, it, it kind of works as a, a multiple level, and I can uh, talk more about that. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, people can definitely call me or email me afterwards. Um, to the left of the uh, Science Barge is the daylighting of the Sawmill River, which is the primary focus of this uh, conversation, and it, this was a parking lot uh, that is now a $20 million river park in downtown Yonkers. It took us about 10 years of uh, up and down to make that happen and followed many of the ideas that Sven um, mentioned. We kind of learned them along the way, so um, 
And then we do a lot of public art, which is below, which is uh, this is American Eel Outdoor Mosaic, done by local high school kids with a with a mosaic artist. We are, we're now building the Yonkers Rail Trail, which is down to the right uh, corner there. So, uh, so we do a lot of actual physical transformation of the community, and then we do uh, a lot of uh, empowering people in the process of physically transforming the community. So we do a lot of the stuff not only in Yonkers, but all around the country. And um, one of our signature programs now is getting kids to Yellowstone National Park every year. And you can see that in the bottom left. So um, this is really a conversation of how we were able to politically maneuver the challenging political climate of getting this daylighting project completed, which is now actually in addition to phase one, which is on the bottom left and the top right, uh, we're now into phase three. And so we, at some point, we crossed a, a uh, political threshold where it's just so ingrained in what's happening in our town that it just keeps going. So you do, once you get over the, the, the big hurdle politically, um, it, then, um, it then can go downhill in a good way very quickly. And politically, it was really, it was, though a financial challenge, it was primarily a political challenge to get people to believe that we could actually open up a river in a downtown and, uh, and revitalize the whole community really through that process. And, um, and originally when, uh, well, I'll go back a step. Originally when I, uh, when we, we brought up this idea, we went up to a meeting at City Hall, and they basically pulled me into a room on the side and said, look, this is, a, you know, this is not an idea you want to pursue. You know, they were nice about it, but you know, it was very clear that this wasn't where they wanted to go with, with the downtown. And, and um, so it took many years of, of, of pushing our agenda to actually get them to see the value of the idea in the first place. I think the main lesson that we learned, um, and I think part of it is a personality thing um, between myself and Anne Marie, who uh, it was our river program director and still is, it was, um, who led a lot of this work, was, and she came out of municipal government. So um, we really put ourselves in the shoes of the people in City Hall. We didn't come in and say, you know, uh, you know, you got to move this project or demand anything from them. Um, and, and this slide is really meant to to kind of, uh, uh, you know, people like to push their idea of their town in this kind of happy view of, of things. But the, the real reality in a lot of the towns, especially the towns that, that we work in that have lost a lot of jobs, lost a lot of uh, employment, have compromised school systems, is that it is a very fractious environment. We have, you know, especially now with a lot of things going around the country with police issues and minority communities, um, pretty much the people in City Hall, uh, in our experience, have somewhat of a bunker mentality. And there, there is a kind of a fear of who is this coming in the room? Who, you know, what do they want? You know, I don't have the money to do really what I, you know, even the basic things I want. And they're coming in and asking for some crazy idea that, um, you know, isn't dealing with the crisis of the moment. And so we came in with this perspective that, um, you know, that, they're, that the, the, the city employees are under a lot of stress. And, and we wanted them to, to, you know, we wanted to tell them that we understood where they where they were at emotionally, <laughs> primarily. And uh, this is actually the guy in England that started Groundwork uh, many years ago. But, but yeah. Let me jump in for a second. There's yeah. some loud uh, keyboard noise, some typing in the background. If you're on the line and that's you, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Star six. Back to you. Sure. Right. And I just noticed I'm actually going a little slower than I thought. So let me pick this up because we're running out of time. Um, so one of the big things we did and I think this came up a little bit earlier, is what do, you, what do you ask for when you go in to one of these meetings? And mostly what I'm talking about is the local relationship. And it's really important, I think, to 
be able to go in with a big grand vision. You can't lose track of this um, idea that you've got a bold idea that that you're trying to move forward. Now you could say, oh, you know, we need $20 million for this, and, and but right now this is what we need. And I think that came up before, but you have to always come back to the bold vision and the big idea, because in a way, that's how you're going to get people's attention. Um, you know, if you come in and say, oh, you know, we just want a rain garden here or there, people aren't going to take you seriously over time. But if you say, this is where we're going, um, and you can develop the vision, obviously, in partnership with all the partners in the community, especially, but you have to have the big vision. And we did, we've done that pretty much on every one of our projects, which is we kind of create the visual of where we're going 10, 20 years from now. We have found that that, you know, that really, in a, in a deep emotional way, captures people. Um, the other thing we we did too, and this gets back to the idea of of understanding where they're coming from is we didn't come in and say this is our town, you know, you're, you're not doing this for, you know, you work for us. We were always respectful that um, that they had they had decision making authority, that the daylighting area was something under their control. Um, we, we were, um, as Sven said, we provided a lot of information, but we we never presumed that somehow we had some greater authority than the mayor or the city council president. Um, the other thing is to be aware of the context, and Sven mentioned this, but there's a lot that gets said uh, about what you're trying to do when you're not in the room. And, and so it's important to use your other political contacts to understand what, what people really think about what you're trying to do. Um, and the other, and I, we mentioned data and intellectual arguments and being the kind of honest broker about the project, but uh, we've also found that there's a political context to the nonprofit arena, which some of you uh, are working in. And um, we had to work that out with the other big nonprofit we were, we were partnering with on this, Cena Hudson. And it took a long time because we were both um, trying, trying to take credit for the project. We had very different roles. They came in more, um, you know, this is what you should do. And we were like, you know, you know, sort of good cop, bad cop. And that, in the end, that worked out really well. But we had to be, understand the political environment, not just with the decision makers, but with other nonprofits. Um, and I, this point is really important because you can walk in the door and, and have an idea, but you, you won't be taken seriously. Uh, it's important. To, to have power to move something is to people to feel that you're legitimate. And one of the ways they, they, they think you're legitimate, especially at the local level, is to be able to bring in grant money or bring, a, bring in federal money um, on your own for your project. That, we pretty much did that. We're pretty good grant writers and we're pretty talented at figuring out where we could get money. And we were able to bring money to the table to the project, which in the end allowed us to be literally designing the project with the city. We're the only people in the room other than the city. And that's because we, we brought resources to the table in a town that was very stretched. Uh, we brought in like the national eel expert. Um, with the money we, we got, we brought in people from around the country, EPA and others, to, to take the local, which can be very provincial, and, and say, look, here's the guy that does this. And, and that again, made us appear to be very legitimate, which we, you know, I guess it was more than appear. Um, Anne Marie, who we hired to do this project, had years of experience in City Hall, very di diplomatic person. Um, we found that made a big difference, um, able to kind of manage what was being said uh, tactfully. Uh, get decision makers to events that came up before. Um, we also were very clear that we wanted to show forward momentum, even in the worst of times when there was no money, when it seemed like the project was dead, we always did something, whether it was a great summer over cleanup or a charrette, it's something that showed that, in fact, this project was happening. Um, and this is a slide we use a lot to talk about groundwork, which is um, action occurs when people believe that you represent a certain level of trust. 
And uh, that means not just trust with government, but trust with the community and the business community. So um, the, the politics at the local level are, are complicated, and the public officials are not the only actors. And you have to win everybody over in order to move on your project. A um, couple other things, i got a couple minutes. Um, we, have, we found that we developed such a great relationship with City Hall, but guess what? The mayor left, and then there was a whole new crew, and that took us about 18 months. Um, they were like, who are you guys? And we were like, well, we, we did this project. They are like, oh, really? Uh, and, and it took a long time, and you just, you know, you kind of have to anticipate that, I guess. Um, the, um, again, you know, we didn't get everything we wanted with this project, but you know what? The project never ends, really. We are working on it constantly. We're building outdoor classrooms. We're, we've got a farmer's market in the daylighting park. We've got public art going on. So there's a ton of stuff to do, even if what you initially did isn't exactly what you wanted. Um, and, uh, and once we were successful on that, we, we were, you know, our legitimacy level went way up. We just took on another crazy project, was build, building a rail trail from New York City to downtown Yonkers that will connect with the daylighting project. And we're probably three years ahead of where we thought we'd be. And um, there's a tipping point on these projects that if, you, if the, the policymakers believe you can pull one off, they believe you can pull two or three off. So that's it. And i um, happy to take any questions. If there's any questions for Rick, please um, share them. Um, I realize, Rick, and I apologize, we didn't give you long enough to tell you the, to, to tell the story of just what a magnificent restoration project that has been. But the sawmill daylighting really is one of the, um, you know, becoming one of the best known daylighting projects around the country and has been hugely successful. So I'm sure you can go um, to their website to learn more about the specifics of the, the restoration itself. Um, again, uh, I don't know that uh, Rick's presentation doesn't include his contact information, but we will make sure to um, include the emails for all of our three speakers, Zen, Keeley, and Rick. So um, if you have particular questions specific to them, you can, you can ask them um, follow up after this webinar. And we will follow up with uh, handouts to all the presentations, in particular handouts that Keeley wanted me to share with everybody. So keep an eye out for those as well. Um, at the bottom left of your screen, you see a URL for um, for an evaluation form. Once we close this meeting room, you will um, your your um, uh, search engine shall take you directly to it. So please just take a couple of minutes to let us know um, to let us know how uh, this webinar helped or other topics that we might uh, cover in the future. A quick question from Gloria um, for Rick: How do you manage and foster collaboration among other groups uh, working on the same topic? Um, how do you handle that competition? I don't know if you have a brief. That's a, that's a big question. I don't know if you have anything you can share on that, Rick. Well, I mean, at first we got really pissed off at each other. <laughs> and um, and um, I, I, honestly, we went out to dinner one night in New York City, which is right next to Yonkers, and we, we just kind of realized it was just kind of not, a, not helping anything to be mad. And we, we've since really understood, I think, understanding with who is playing what role. Not neither of us taking credit for the whole thing, which both of us were trying to do, um, but really saying they did this, we did this, and uh, now actually it's really, uh, just, we're just in a really great place. Great. All right. Well, without further ado, I want to thank our three presenters, Sven, Rick, and, and Keeley. Thank you so much for taking the time, as well as all of you who took time this afternoon to join us. Uh, we hope to see you at an upcoming Urban Waters Learning Network webinar. We'll continue to host these sessions, but we do look for folks to give us ideas for topics that would be useful to your work. So you can do that at the evaluation form. The link is right there on the, on the chat box and it should open up a box for you as soon as I close this meeting room. So thank you again, everybody, and have a great afternoon. I appreciate all your attendance.